Amen. Please be seated. Amen. Friends, as we uh, continue our series uh, here today, our series, A New Day Dawns, I want to invite you again to open up to the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. Second book, Genesis, Exodus. To Exodus in chapter 16, in the Pew Bible, it would be on page 110. Um, Exodus in chapter 16 today. We'll be beginning at the first verse. Exodus chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt! There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, and the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. And on the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? And Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. So ends our reading today, beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for the word that, uh, that you give us here today. It is a mighty word with a deep message for each one of us today, Lord. And I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, enable us to hear this message. That you would open up our hearts and our minds and our souls. And Lord, that you would give me the words to share so that uh, I would grow. And that uh, you would enable all of us to grow. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, when last we were uh, together, we had introduced this, uh, this series, and it was the day that God, through Moses, led the Israelites out of Egypt after 430 years of bondage. And if you know the story from that point to the point where you're at today, there was a moment when uh, Pharaoh, after he said, get out, go, there was a moment that Pharaoh had second thoughts. And when he got, had those second thoughts, he sent all of the armies of Egypt out after the Israelites after they had left. And eventually, the Israelites ended up at the banks of the sea. The mighty hand of God working through Moses. A mighty wind blew all night. And in the morning, the sea had split. And the Israelites walked across the sea on dry ground. And when they got to the other side, the Egyptians had followed them into the seabed. And it was at that moment that God brought the sea back together again. And the Egyptians were no more, at least as far as 
being a threat to, is, to the Israelites is concerned. That was a day that uh, the Israelites of that age would have celebrated because the threat was gone. And so the journey continued to the point where we pick it up here today, again at verse 1, where it says, The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. It only took a month and a half before the griping began. Only a month and a half. And, you know, it's easy for me and any one of us to, to sit back and to uh, criticize them, but I think this is a great, great example of our human nature because they had seen everything that God had done to that point. And seeing that after this 430 years, which God had a purpose for, and we talked about that last week, after these 430 years, all of the wonders of the plagues that God did in Egypt until the last one and, and, and uh, Pharaoh said, go, how God led them out through Moses and then seeing this final miracle that set them truly free from the Israelites, God split the sea and they walked through it. And they brought it back together again, eliminating the threat from the Egyptians. They had seen all of it. But then, a month and a half later, they're ready to go back to Egypt because they weren't, uh, they were hungry. I get that, I guess, because it's part of our human nature. When I think about the journey that we have been on, I remember like it was yesterday, watching the TV and reading on the internet and whatnot about how it was that all we had to do was shut down for two weeks and the threat was going to be over last March. And it didn't work out quite that way. And I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody because, you know, I mean, seriously, a brand new virus and we're still learning about it, but there was that sense, I believe, after about two weeks or maybe after a month and a half where, you know, we can do this, we can do this, and all of a sudden, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I want to go back. I want to go back to the way it was. And I get that because I want to go back to the way it was. God reveals truth in this passage of Scripture that perhaps is even more poignant today than uh, it, uh, it might have otherwise have been. Several truths emerge out of this passage. Number one truth is this, and this may shock all of you. Patience is not an inherent true, uh, human trait. Do I hear an amen on that? <laughs> Patience is not inherent to humans. I know it's not to me. It wasn't to the Egypt or to the Israelites. And you go back far enough, it certainly wasn't uh, a trait that was shown very well in our first parents, Adam and Eve, was it? No, no, not at all. You know, even even you know, as we look at the people around us, we look at the people that we know, even the ones that appear to be the most patient among us, remind me of the picture of a a duck on a, on the lake, you know, where the part above the water just looks real serene and going with the waves. And we can't see underneath the water where it's just churning like a son of a gun. I know that's the way it is with me. Even when I try to be patient, uh, that can be a very big challenge because patience 
is not an inherently human trait. It just simply is not. And that leads to this truth, that sometimes sin emerges from our lack of patience. Sin emerges from our lack of patience. You can go back to the story of the Garden of Eden, but how many times perhaps in our own life have we seen that where we might lose patience with somebody or something and decide, now it's time to take matters into my own hands. And maybe we do something rash because impulsiveness is quite a bit more of our inherent human trait than patience is. It's just not natural to us to be patient. And we learned this truth here a while back in the series on the Holy Spirit, that patience is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Remember that list from, from Galatians, I think chapter 5? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. At the end of the day, patience, not being an inherently human trait, is actually the result of the work that God's Holy Spirit does within us. That's where patience comes from. It's the work of God's Holy Spirit within us. So any one of us who has ever uttered that uh, that very, very classic prayer about patience. You remember how that one goes? God, please give me patience, and I mean right now. There's some validity to that prayer. <laughs> there really is. And maybe that's a prayer that we need to utter with an open and loving heart all the more often because that is part of the work that God does within us. Patience, not being inherently human, is very much a part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which then leads to this reminder again today, what we shared last Sunday, that God has a purpose for allowing us to be challenged. God had a purpose for allowing the Israelites to uh, be in Egypt for 430 years, and as they came out, God had a purpose for everything that they ran into, including being trapped against the sea. God had a purpose for that. And now when we get to this point, God has a purpose for this moment when they're hungry. And God has a purpose for the challenges that we face in our life. James writes this, and boy, you know, if we can really take this couple of verses into our heart and truly live them, we would be better off. James in chapter 1 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Some translations say patience, some say endurance, some say perseverance. They all basically mean the same thing. Because the testing of your faith produces patience. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. In a nutshell of just a couple verses, we get the purpose for why it is we face challenges so that we can grow in patience and become mature Christians. That's why we face the stuff of life sometimes, whether it be the stuff of a day or the stuff of a year like 2020. And that's why, that's why the Israelites faced the challenges that they did to help them to grow into maturity. But God heard their voices. And beloved, God hears our voices too when we cry out to him. Lord, grant me patience. 
prayer, good prayer, use that one. God hears our voices when we cry out to him. Picking up at uh, verse 4, because they had cried out to God regarding their hunger, the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Reveals this truth that God will provide for our needs. Now when you go into the biblical um, uh, description of of uh, what manna in the desert and bread uh, in the desert was like. It was unlike anything they'd ever had before and it'd be unlike anything they'd ever have again once they entered the promised land. Uh, it was, it was uh, considered, <coughs> excuse me, to be kind of the small seed-like thing that was a bread of sorts. Uh, some uh, have uh, said that it tasted like coriander or something like that, uh, something that we'll never have, I don't suspect. Uh, because God has another purpose for us. But God provided for them. Again, it wasn't exactly the same thing that they ate in Egypt. But sometimes God's provision for us is that way, isn't it? It's the reminder that God provides for our needs. And not necessarily for our wants. God knows the difference between those two things, right? Much better, frankly, than than we would know ourselves. And so he provided for their needs. He provided for the need of being liberated from bondage and getting them out of, uh, out of harm's way with the Egyptians and now providing them food for the journey and would continue to provide the Israelites along the way. And then God said this in verse 4, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instruction. So one more thing that God provided for the Israelites, he provides for us as well. He provided for them and for us an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to grow. Because God was testing them as he sometimes tests us. Now it leads to this truth, friends. While there is certainly true that sometimes our faith gets really, really tested during times of hardship, I would suggest to you, and I would suggest to me as well, that sometimes the greatest test that God gives any one of us is during the time of plenty. During a time of plenty. When you think about it, when you think about it real hard, many folks, and I'm not talking about anybody else here but me, you have to look in your own hearts about this, Asking the question, when are we most inclined to say, oh, Lord, is it when everything is going well? Or is it when things maybe are not going quite so well? And maybe it's during those times when we perceive that things are going well that God is giving us the biggest test that, uh, that we might face. If you were to go to the gospel, um, you would remember that Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is expected. To whom much is given, much is expected. So the challenge that we have, that the Israelites had, frankly, in the gift of manna and the restrictions or limitations God put on it, is that in taking the blessings, that which we perceive as blessings from God, those times of plenty, are we using them 
to glorify God and to build his church. Remember back to the, ser- uh, the series on the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit's about two things, glorifying God, building his church. During those times of plenty, maybe God is really, really, really challenging us to a greater and deeper faith for the purpose of helping us to grow closer to him and building his church. I think that's something that maybe we need to spend a lot more time on in prayer on during those times of plenty. And maybe they are our most important times of testing. Because God gives, and he wants to know what it is we're going to do with that with which he gives. We glorify God and build God's church. The good news, friends, the good news about how it is that God provides for our needs, not our wants, but our needs, the good news is that we then therefore have everything we need to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. And it's not dependent upon anything else that's going around, going on around us. It's not dependent upon uh, forms of government or amounts of money or anything like that. It is dependent on God meeting our needs and the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. When I look just, you know, focusing in here during times of plenty, that God has provided this church with wonderful saints, with a multitude of gifts for the purpose of spreading the gospel in this community. God has provided homes God has provided this home, this facility, and the resources that we enjoy. And God has provided a mission field of folks who, who many of us love already, but we need to love into the kingdom of God. And that's in good times. And I look back on the challenging times as well. And, you know, there are some like the Israelites uh, who reach that point and say, I'd rather go back to the way it was. I can't do the things I want to do. I can't eat the things I want to eat. And maybe there was a a piece of it in some of our hearts about this past year. We're online only worship. We can't get together. We've got to wear a mask. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. That even in the midst of perceived hardship, God still gave us everything we needed. Maybe not everything we wanted, but everything we needed to share his love. Every single one of us still had the opportunity, wherever it was that we were, to pick up a Bible and to read God's love letter to us. Every single one of us still had the opportunity to drop to our knees or our, our, our chairs or whatever our posture would be to offer a prayer of thanksgiving for all the ways God has blessed us and a prayer of, of intercession for those around us. Nobody took that away, and that still remains. Nobody got in the way of us picking up a phone or an email and telling somebody else how much Jesus loved them or how much we love them because Jesus loves us. We have everything we needed. We continue today to have everything that we need. Maybe not everything we want, but everything we need because a holy and loving God has given it to us. For the purpose of glorifying him and building his church. 
Oh, and at the same time, taking care of us. Because that's how much God loves us. Even in the necessities of life, as we live in accordance with the way God wants us to live, we're being taken care of. Especially as we love God and love our neighbor as well. And it doesn't matter if the times are normal or if the times are challenged. That's the good news, friends. That's the reason why I rejoice today. Because it doesn't matter the stuff going on around us as we are in this new day today. Yeah, we take the precautions because they're a part of how it is that we love our neighbors as ourselves. But God has given us everything we need in order to live as he wants us to live, to glorify him, and to build his church. And I want to close with these words from the Apostle Paul. We've shared them before. Maybe they're familiar to you. He said this to the Philippian church, chapter 4. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, maybe patient. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Remember the words of that old song that, uh, that has... We don't necessarily sing here in church, but might be familiar to many of us. Remember these words. We never walk alone. To God be the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for all the ways that, uh, all the ways, Lord, that you provide for our needs. You are a loving God who uh, has promised us that you would always provide for our needs as we walk with you. We just pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us to not only be patient both in the circumstances that we might find ourselves in, but also, Lord, to be patient in the work that you are doing in your perfect time. We know, Lord, that it doesn't always match our timetable. But the fault lies with us when we lose our patience there. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would help each one of us to grow in patience. And as we grow in patience, that the challenges that we face will help us to grow in maturity as well. We thank you for being our provision. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.